Paul in his uh, letter to the church at Corinth um, kind of just spills his guts just like they did in song. Amen? Uh, so why are we diving into 2 Corinthians? Uh, you're like, Pastor, didn't we just do 1 Corinthians uh, about two and a half years ago? Uh, yeah, so that's why we're diving into 2 Corinthians. Um, I think the, the Lord has a word for us. Um, was going to jump into some major minor prophets this fall, and the Lord just honestly directed my heart in a different direction over the summer. Um, so I kind of try to lay out things about anywhere between six months to a year and saying, Lord, what do you want us to digest together as a body? Um, and based on where we're at as a church, I really feel like Second Corinthians is it. Um, and I believe the Lord has led us there, talked with our pastors and our leaders and said, hey, uh, what do you think? And they're like, yeah, this is good. So uh, we're calling this abundant grace. Um, we call it First Corinthians grace and peace because those two words are laced throughout First Corinthians. Uh, Second Corinthians, we're calling it abundant grace because here's why. Um, as we begin running down the road as a church and we begin to experience some of the blessings that we talked about last week, uh, we can sometimes think that we did that. Uh, We can sometimes think that has to do with our obedience, uh, and it has everything to do with the grace of God. And so here's what we need from you. Uh, Here's what you need from me. Here's what we need from each other for the next, as long as Jesus gives us, okay? Uh, And it's this, we need weakness. Like, we need your failure. We need your disappointment, Uh, And you need mine. Um, What you don't need is success. What you don't need is accolades. What you don't need, what I don't, what we need is weakness so that the power of Christ can rest upon us. Church, we need abundant grace. We have fooled ourselves and we live in an economy and we live in a group of people and we live in Chesterfield County where everybody says, get your stuff and have it ready. And if you don't, there's something wrong. And church, what this county needs, what this county needs, the world needs to, needs our weakness so that the power of Christ can shine through us. Uh, So if you're here today and you're like, man, I am messed up in this or this is what's going on, you are in the right place. Um, You are in the right place because just like that waterfall picture is a little guy standing in front of a waterfall um, and you just feel this mist. By the way, uh, I learned this week that this picture is actually from, guess where? This is fun. Uh, it's from, um, oh, I just lost it, Iceland. Uh, so if you're in the second service last week, I didn't tell him the first service, I'm sorry. Uh, but I told a story about what God did and how he used a, a guy who was a missionary in Iceland. And I found it absolutely amazing. This is, this is a picture in Iceland. And literally, where the guy's standing, you can't help but feel the <laughs> as you stand in front of the waterfall. When you stand in front of something like that, you feel what? Small. And as abundant as that water is, is how much, just a small fraction of how abundant the grace of God is. Um, Hear me, uh, the lie of American Christianity is that you have to be perfect in order for God to use you. The lie of your theology that you say to yourself every day is that you have to be good enough in order for God to use you. And the truth of God's word in scripture is you don't. God is good. He's good. We're not. We're not good on our own. We're not. I don't care if you've been following Jesus for 50 years. You're still not good on your own. Um, God is good, and it's Christ in you that's good. The quicker we grasp that, the better off we're going to be. Um, so 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul founded the church in Corinth. So here's why. Let me just kind of give you a little background for a moment. Do not like just go wah, 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 Charlie Brown for the next two minutes. All right. Uh, tune in. All right. Lean forward. All right. This is Paul's fourth letter, really. Okay. He wrote one. Uh, he founded the church at Corinth, ministered there for a year and a half. Go read Acts 18 to figure that out. And then serious problems in the church arise after his departure. And he sends Timothy to deal with them. 
and then he wrote this letter that we call 1 Corinthians. And remember, we, we, we walked through that, and we, we memorized 1 Corinthians 13 together as a body of Christ. We're like, hey, if we don't have love, we got nothing, right? And the greatest of these, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. So um, unfortunately, though, after that, the matters just grew worse, and Paul had to make what he called a painful visit to Corinth to confront the troublemakers. Can I just tell you, I've been in rooms confronting troublemakers, and it's not a lot of fun. Um, but... It's what God calls us to, amen? I'm sure some of you have been in those rooms where you've confronted troublemakers, and it's not fun, is it? Is it? No, it's just not. Um, and so the matters we were, still no solution. He wrote then a severe letter, which was delivered by his associate Titus, that was not inspired by God. Anyway, that's why we don't have it, all right? That's why we don't read that. Um, and after a great deal of distress, Paul finally met Titus, got the good report the problem had been solved. Whoosh, it was then that he wrote this letter that we now call 2 Corinthians. And here's why he wrote it. Paul wanted to encourage the church to forgive and restore the member who had caused all the trouble. I had a conversation with a young man this week who honestly is just struggling to forgive his father and his mother. Have they, has great injustice been done to him? Yes. Is he doing himself any favors by holding no in his bitterness? No. Paul wrote this letter to encourage us to forgive. One of the key words in this letter is comfort and encouragement. The word comfort and encouragement in verb form is used 18 times in this letter. And the noun is used 11 times. So in spite of all the trials that ha has, has been experienced, Paul was able, by the grace of God, to write a letter saturated with encouragement. Now hear me, discouragement. We're going to talk about discouragement. Discouragement is no respecter of persons. You want to go through like what you feel like is some of the most successful people like in Christendom, like go back to like Charles Spurgeon. That man suffered with depression more than I think any other human being that's walked the face of the earth. I'm just go read some of the things that he's written. Discouragement is no respecter of persons. In fact, discouragement comes after especially the successful. For it seems to be the higher that we climb, the further down we fall. We should not be surprised then when we read that the great apostle Paul we're going to read this today, was pressed out of measure. He even despaired of his own life, verse 8 is going to tell us in a minute. Great as he was in character and ministry, Paul was human just like the rest of us. And so what then, what then was Paul's secret to victory when he was experiencing all these trials and pressures? And, and here was his secret to victory. Are you ready? This was his secret to victory. This is the big secret, all right? It was God. Like Paul's secret to victory was God. So when you find yourself discouraged and ready to quit, get your attention off yourself and your stuff and focus it on God alone. There's three outlooks that a person has of suffering in life, all right? So when we engage the suffering of life, unfair things, horrible things, when we've been faithful spouse and our spouse is unfaithful back to us, when they decide they don't want to be with us anymore, like all of that, like, what do we do? All right, here's three outlooks. The first one is this. If suffering is the product of fate or chance, okay, if it's just fate or just chance, which is like Hollywood's version of everything, all right, then our only, Disney-esque, okay, this is it, fate or chance, then our only recourse is to give up or to fight fate, right? This is my fight song, all right? I mean, like, like, that's, our, that's our response, okay? Is you just fight fate or you just, you know, give up, all right? That's one response, okay? That's Hollywood's response, that's Disney. Or if we control everything ourselves, then our situation is equally as hopeless. That's a little Disney too. Just look within your heart, right? Yet yeah, no. Or thirdly, if God is in control, and we trust him, then we can overcome any circumstance with his help. That's what that, that Casting Crowns song is, right? You know, by the power of Christ in me. 2 Corinthians 1, stand with me in honor of reading God's word. We're going to jump into 2 Corinthians 1. I'm just going to read the first 11 verses. Um, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians most likely through just the first week in December if you want to know when this will be over at the beginning, just like a good doctor tells you or a nurse when they get ready to give you a shot. You have three of these. All right, you've got 13. Are you ready? Some of you don't look ready. 
It's going to be fun. I was talking to the brother last night. He was like, I'm excited about this. I'm like, you're just excited we're getting out of the Psalms. I know. Anyway, all right. 2 Corinthians 1. Here we go. Verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. And he says these words. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Come on. Mercies and the God of all what? Comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by who? Come on. God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. That's worthy of an amen. Right? Yeah, like he says, if you're going to suffer with Christ, you also get all of his comfort. Woo! Right? Like that's good news. All right, so verse 6, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, You will also share in our comfort, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Paul's like, look, I wasn't above this. I was depressed. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. That's worth memorizing. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Let's pray. God, bless the reading and the hearing of your word. Now, God, may the words of my mouth and, Lord, these notes, Jesus, may they please, God, be a reflection of your grace. May they be pleasing to you, God. You are our rock and our redeemer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Have a seat if you would. We're just going to walk through four things very quickly. Uh, They were only three until Thursday morning, and then I had this ha ha moment, and it was exciting because it was another P. All right, so I did alliterate this time. I'm sorry, um, but it's just one of those things. I did not, I hated that as a kid. Like, listening to preachers, I'm like, why does all four words have to be P, you know, or something like that? And then I started preaching, and I realized that's why. All right, and I can't explain it to you other than there you go, but it'll help you remember it. All right, so first thing, because we share in the suffering and comfort of God, which is the theme of these first 11 verses. You share in comfort and you share in suffering. So because, why? Why do we do this? Why does this happen for us as believers? Because we share in the suffering and comfort of God, here's the first one, we can praise the Lord. Paul begins his whole letter with a doxology. By the way, the doxology, you guys remember that song? If you sung it growing up, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just formative. Like, these things are good. They're good for us. A doxology isn't just the name of a song, though, all right? Doxology is literally a a a prescription of praise, Like, that's what we can call a a liturgy or doxology. We have a liturgy here at Parkway. You just may not know it. We don't feel like we're liturgical. We're not liturgical. Liturgical just means we have an order. We have an order. We sing some songs about Jesus. We remember, oh, yeah, he's God. I'm not. We pray in ways that go, oh, that we give to the Lord, and then we open up the word of life, hear the word preached, and then occasionally we baptize, and we often celebrate the supper. And then we have at the end of our service a time to respond to what God is saying to us. And then we leave and we go tell people about Jesus. Like that's our liturgy, right? It's not hard. We have a prescribed way to engage with the Lord. He tells us to do these things. And it's okay to do that. It's okay. Sometimes we mix the order up. We call ourselves spontaneous, right? All right, so here in 2 Corinthians, Paul, Paul praises God for who he was and what he had done, and what he was doing. And it's good for you and me to praise the Lord. Praise, praise is for God's glory 
and praise us for our good. The last thing that any of us feel like doing when we're suffering is praising. And the thing that will deliver us in our suffering is praising God. Like, why do you think that is? The enemy doesn't want you to praise the Lord. He wants you to stay quiet. The enemy doesn't want you to come to church when you're hurting or you're embarrassed. He wants you to stay home and isolated from the body of Christ. But that's exactly what you need to do. You need to come and press into the Lord and praise the Lord. The best thing we need to do when we're suffering is to praise God. We praise Him for what Paul was praising God for. Here's the four things. We, the, he, we praise God because the only God has become our God. He says in verse 3, Blessed be the God of, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only God has actually become our God. Praise, by the way, changes things just as much as prayer changes things, all right? We hear that all the time. Prayer changes things. Got to pray, got to pray. That's true, but man, praise changes things too. You can't always sing. You may be like, Pastor, I don't feel like singing this morning. That's fine. You can't always sing about your circumstances, but you can always sing about and to the God who is in control of all your circumstances, like one time I was in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and I was lost, all right? I was with a bunch of my American friends and missionary. We were having a great time. We had just got back from this Noah Kali region where I had heard this man with this beard like share with us. We, we watched the Jesus film, Jesus video, and he goes, I, I saw this 25 years ago, and I've been waiting for somebody to come back. And that thought had been rattling in my head for 24 hours as we drove back to Dhaka, and then we were supposed to take this launch and go down to the southern part of Dhaka, and I had my three friends with me and this cab shows up two cabs show up and all my American friends and missionary jumped in the other cab and they put me in the other cab with all the, the Bengalis and I was like I either smell or you guys don't like me that's fine you know what I mean and so I'm, I'm riding down the road sitting next to this Muslim driver and he's got a turban and I'm thinking Lord this is just a lot right now and uh, I wouldn't talk to anybody I didn't know if anybody knew any English and I was too scared to talk and so we're, we're riding down the road and we get lost they said the drive to the launch, which was this boat that was going to take us down to the southern part, was going to take about 30 to 45 minutes. Well, at the about 40-minute mark, we passed something that previously the day before it only take us about like six minutes to get by. And I'm like, I think we're lost. And I look over the driver, and he's doing one of these numbers. And I'm like, bro, you don't speak English, and I don't speak Bangla, but I can tell you don't know where you're going, you know? And, uh, and I was like, but he can't understand me. And, and then I had a phone that didn't work. And so I was like, man, this is before, like, everybody had cell phones everywhere. Um, and so I had a cell phone, but it didn't work in that country. And so I was like, I didn't have a number. I know what's going to do. And then I started thinking about all these lost people. And I'm like, there's like, there's like, what, what, 150 million people in this country, and there's like 10,000 Christians, maybe, maybe less. Like, this, this is just really big. It's too much for me. I can't do it. And I started to despair of life. I mean, I did. In like this ride, I despaired of life. I thought, I'm never going to see my wife again. I'm never going to see my kids. And I just started like bumming myself out. Like, mm, this task is way too impossible. And all of a sudden, right behind me, it's about 45, 50 minutes into the ride, I hear this I hear this beautiful thing. Um, there was a man and two women in the back. Come to find out his name was Andrew. He was a doctor and then two, nurse, uh, two nurses. And here's, here's what he just does. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I remembered a sermon that I'd heard right before I left. Sunday morning, I heard a sermon preached by a guy named Scott Smith. And he had said that our, well, all we're supposed to do is just go take the praise of God into a place where it's not. And God will do the rest. So we sang to one another for the next, like, hour. Like, come to find out, uh, his son was the worship leader at his church. And he knew English fine. I was the dumb person who didn't talk to him. Um, and so for the next, like, 45 minutes, we just sang to one another. And man, when I got there, I was like, Jesus is going to take this country, man. It's going to be awesome. Now, that's a big difference than 45 minutes before. What happened? I praised the Lord. That's what happened. And actually, it wasn't me. It was him. His praise encouraged mine. His praise took that little tiny flame in me and went whoosh, and fire came out of my mouth. If nothing else, to remind me that God was good and that he's got this. 
He's got this. Paul starts, blessed be. If we don't make it past point one, I'm good, all right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God of Jesus has become our God. Like, that's worth praising him and hanging out there for a while. Hey, the people in the schools that you go to and the people in the workplaces, they need to know that the God of the universe is your God and he can be their God too. Like that's the only thing we're telling them. They need to hear that. You need to be reminded of that. And not only that God is is our God, but also the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has become our Father. So not only has God become our God, but Father has become our Father. He says, blessed be the God and Father. Like, is he being redundant? No. He's saying, sovereign God of the universe is now your sovereign God, and personal, intimate daddy, Abba, has become your personal, intimate daddy. Like the same daddy of Jesus is your daddy. Wow! Just after the resurrection, Mary had gone to the tomb. Like, just in case we we want to, why why does Paul say this all the time? This is crazy. I went back and looked. Just after the resurrection, remember this? Mary, she goes, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. She's weeping. She's suffering because, man, her Savior, the one who rescued her from death, had died. And two angels appear telling her, hey, Jesus is risen from the dead. And then she turns around and she, she sees the gardener, right? What she thinks is a gardener, it's really Jesus. And she's like, Rabbi. And she goes running to like cling to him. And he goes, don't, right? This is what he says. Look at John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus says, or he says, don't cling to me. You may think, man, that sounds kind of harsh. Jesus said, don't give me a hug. He says, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But he said, but instead, go to my brothers, cling to them, right, and say to them, I am ascending to, look at this, my what? Come on, say it out loud. It's good. My what? My Father and now what? Come on. Your Father. Jesus is saying, hey, don't cling to me. You get to cling to God. Ah! He's saying now, Father God has become your Father and to my God, your God. He was was instituting something that had never happened before. And a little later on, just like give it like a month and a half, the Holy Spirit's going to come at Pentecost and fill every believer? What? Like God has become our God and Father has become our Father? Man, we can do anything with that. We can go anywhere. That's abundant grace. Like there's enough there to have an invitation. You need nothing else. I need nothing else. And not only that, but then he goes on. He says, the the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of mercies in verse 3. And the God of all comfort. So the Father of mercy, like the guy who, who invented mercy, has given you and I mercy. Like, do you ever think about the fact that all mercy originates with God? And can only be secured from God so that when you and I receive mercy here on earth or even when we distribute mercy to our kids, we're just being just like him because it all originated with him. Which kind of makes you think when you withhold mercy, maybe you think you're bigger than God. God's mercies are inexhaustible in supply. Like the picture of that water. Like inexhaustible. His mercies are inexhaustible. And not only is his mercy inexhaustible, but it says the Father of all comfort has given us comfort. So the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we can comfort others who are in any affliction with the comfort that we ourselves are comforted by God. That's a lot of comfort. I was talking to my wife this week and she goes, I've read this like seven times and I don't understand what he's saying. He just says comfort all the time. And I'm like, right, yeah. It took me about 20 to figure it out. And I don't even know if I get it all. I just like made it past verse 3, and I'm like, I got that. I'm supposed to sing to the Lord. The word comfort is repeated 10 times in 2 Corinthians 1 through 11. Comfort. Now hear me. Here's here's the issue that you and I have with comfort. We think comfort is sympathy. Because a lot of us don't want comfort. Have you ever been there before? Like I've been there with my spouse sometimes. Something's going on. I put my hand around. Don't comfort me. I'm like, sorry. Okay, yeah. Like, I want to be mad right now. I want to be in my... Th- it's like, that's the deal. We want to be, mm, you know? Comfort is not sympathy because sympathy 
Listen, sympathy can weaken us instead of strengthen us. And let's pray. It's 10 2. God, help us to share comfort with the rest of the world by sending people to tell them about it. In Jesus' name, amen. God does not pat us on the head, okay, and give us a piece of candy or a toy to distract our attention from our troubles. That's not comfort. No, here's what comfort is. It's putting strength in your heart. The English word for comfort comes from two Latin words, which simply means this, with strength. So the Greek word for comfort then means to come alongside and help. So when he says that he's going to comfort you, it's not, oh, sweet little boy, you're going to be okay. It's, I'm going to come put my arm around you and nothing hits you that doesn't hit me first. Like that should give us joy, right? That's comfort. Comfort is strength to face our trials and triumph over them. The word for comfort here, by the way, this is crazy. The word for comfort here is the same word for the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16. It's the word paraclete in in Greek. So the same word when Jesus says he's going to give you a great comforter, it's the same word that Paul's using here when he's on comfort, comfort, comfort. He's saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So if you love God, then you love to sing about his comfort. Singing drives out the world. By the way, singing, did you know singing gets the devil mad? Because singing brings the special presence of God in. My mother-in-law is addicted to praising the Lord. She is. I won't mock her in here because the other people will tell her about it and I'd be scared. Anyway, but... um. She loves to sing the Lord. She loves to work out on a treadmill and sing at the top of her lungs. So I remember they used to live in an RV, and that RV, if we pulled up, would be shaking. And it wasn't because, never mind, but it was, I didn't say it, I didn't say it. Anyway, so, but it was because she was literally on the treadmill, like going as fast as she could, singing at the top of her lungs. My kids mock her all the time. They mock her all the time. And you're like, how dare they? No, my kids are carnal just like I am. But she, here's the deal. Her worship inspires me. Because she's a lady who's addicted to praising the Lord. So here's a question for you and me today. Would anybody accuse you of being addicted to God by the way you praise him? Like, would anybody accuse you of being addicted to praising God? And if the answer is no, why not? Like, just praise Him. Like, do you adore praising the Lord? Like, this comforting strength that we need comes when we praise the Lord and we're reminded of the wealth that we have in belonging to Christ. So because we share in the sufferings and comfort of God, we can praise the Lord. And because we share in the suffering and comfort of God, we can proclaim his gospel comfort. God always, always prepares us for what he is preparing us for. And part of that preparation is our suffering and our comfort. So here's the deal. We all have affliction. Like there will never be a time in your life that you will be immune to affliction Since Jesus suffered, so will I. So because Jesus suffered for us, we can suffer like him. 2 Timothy 3.12 says it like this. This was crazy. I saw this this week. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, listen to this, will be persecuted. Not if, but will. So we don't earn our forgiveness by suffering as Jesus did. No, no, no. We are free to love as Jesus did did because our sins are forgiven in Christ. So hear me loud and clear. Beware of any church, any church movement, okay? And I, I, I so badly want to call out a few specific ones right now, but I won't. But I'm going to just give you the litmus. All right, look. Be aware of any church teaching practice that says you can avoid affliction or that your affliction is a lack of faith or your failure to speak it. Like, don't listen to that garbage, And don't let anybody tell you that your faith is weak because you're suffering. Your faith is not weak because you're suffering. And if they say that to you, then you just whip out your 2 Timothy 3.12 and turn it around. Okay? And you say, nah. All right? Nah. And that's a biblical word. All right? 
Look, we all are afflicted, okay? We all have abundant comfort of God available to us, though. So we're all going to be afflicted, but we all have this abundance of comfort. And since Jesus provided abundant comfort through his suffering, that means that I will never lack any comfort. John 10.10, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. That's all of us, right? That's affliction. But, but, Jesus says, I have come that you may have what? Life, and not just life, but life what? Abundant, which means you have more than you need. Always, like even in the midst of the craziness, even in the midst of the child that says, I hate your guts, even in the midst of the death of a loved one, like you have abundant comfort available to you. God is using your affliction and he's using your comfort and he's also using your endurance to be a living illustration of Jesus to people who would not understand salvation without it. We're going to get there in 2 Corinthians 4, but just a little preview to help us understand it is Colossians 1.24. It says this, now, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. So this is a crazy thought. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And it's Paul writing, and he's writing to the church in, in Colossae, and he goes, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, for the sake of the church. And in my flesh, he goes, I'm literally filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. And what he means by that is, They were so separated just by years, okay, in just a few years, from watching Jesus die on the cross. They were separated by time and space that in order for people sometimes to understand the significance of his his suffering on the cross, they have to watch other Christians suffer and endure to begin to understand what he had done for them. It's a crazy thought, but that's what he signs us all up for when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The best way I know to illustrate it was a story I heard from Michael Card in a book uh, called Let the Nations Be Glad, and it's from a Maasai warrior named Joseph. He heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. He heard it and was so excited about it that he went door to door to his village, knocking on the doors, telling each one of them, hey, you got to hear this good news. You got to hear this good news. You got to hear this good news. And, And after a little bit, the people began to get a little stirred up, and they weren't stirred up in a holy way. They were stirred up in an angry way because they thought he was lying. And they beat him within an inch of his life, dragged him out, and left him to die. And so a couple of days go by. He kind of wakes up, realizes, oh, man, I'm still alive. Praise the Lord. And he thought, I must have said something wrong. So he goes back into the same village, and he goes, stands in the middle of the huts of all the ones around it, and he just begins to proclaim what he heard uh, from the missionary that he had met earlier. And he, he, he just shares as openly as he can they all come this time with clubs and beat him, not just within an inch of his life, but pretty close to dead. And they drag him out, leave him outside to die. Third time, or second time, he wakes up and he goes, I must have said something wrong. This time he crawls back, finally gets up, walks back to the village and begins sharing. They barely let him get any words out of his mouth and they beat him and he loses consciousness. This third time he wakes up in the middle of the infirmary in the village. And the women said to him, who were taking care of him, who had nursed him back to health, we couldn't understand the grace of God until we watched you suffer. We thought you were lying. No one could love us that much. But once we saw that you were willing to come three times and tell us the same message, we figured you weren't lying. And the whole village, while he had been out, had given their lives to Christ. There are people in your world that will never know Christ until they watch you suffer and they watch you receive comfort from the Holy Spirit and from brothers and sisters in Christ and then they will know about the sufferings of Christ because what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, not that there's anything lacking in his salvation, there's nothing lacking, what's lacking is their understanding of it will be made manifest by your presence in their life. And none of us in our flesh would say, sign me up. None of us would. But when I go back and read some of the early church fathers, that's exactly what they were saying, is sign me up for this so that people can hear. And I'm not talking just people in the Bible. I'm talking like the people who started following Jesus like in 100 A.D. and 75 A.D. and 150 A.D. and 200 A.D. They, they were like saying, hey, sign me up for this. I would be willing that my life would be poured out so that so that someone may know. Church, we don't need to be afraid of losing our religious rights in this country. We, we don't need to be afraid of anything. We just need to press into Jesus. 
Press into Jesus, proclaim him, proclaim his gospel, proclaim his goodness. Because we share in the suffering and comfort of God, we can also persevere in life. And I'll do these quickly, all right? Because the word of God helps us answer and ask, ask and answer, and make sense of some of life's toughest questions. So here's some of the questions. How is God sovereign in our suffering? Have you ever asked that? I have, all right? How, how is God sovereign in our suffering, like, how is he still in control of our suffering? And here, here, here's why. God permits, verse 4 through 7 tells us this. God permits the suffering and comforts us in our suffering. So it should, it should give us comfort to know that God is the one who actually permits the suffering and will comfort us in our suffering. And that God is also in control of all of our suffering. He's controlled throughout our suffering. When God puts his children into the furnace, okay, he keeps his hand on the thermostat and his eye on the thermometer, and you and I can trust that he's a good, loving father, that he is in control throughout our suffering. Now, you and I may despair at some point of life, but hear me, God does not despair of us. He does not despair of us. God also empowers us to bear up under our suffering. Like the first thing he has to do oftentimes for me is to show me how weak I am in myself. I need that like every day, y'all, all all right? And then God wants me to trust him. Not my gifts, not my abilities, not my experience, not my spiritual reserves. Like just about the time that I start to feel self-confident and able to meet the enemy, I fail miserably. And I have to come back to 2 Corinthians 12, 10, which says, for when I'm weak, then I am strong. God empowers me to bear up under suffering. He also delivers me from suffering. God does deliver us from suffering. God may not necessarily deliver us immediately. He may not deliver us in the same way. Like we may see um, someone suffer and us suffering and then we watch God deliver them and we're like, hey God, come on now, right? Like they got their, they're like Job. They got a new spouse. They got a whole bunch of new kids. They got all their money back like tenfold. Like what about me? I want that. And that's not how he works. God does not always deliver us immediately, nor in the same way. James, okay, James, 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 Peter, James, and John in the sailboat, James, he was beheaded. Yet at the same story, Peter was delivered from prison. Both men were delivered from their suffering, but both were delivered in different ways. Sometimes God delivers us from our trials And other times, hear me, he delivers us in our trials. Through all of it, God is glorified. When Paul reported what God had done for him, a great chorus of praise and thanksgiving went up from the saints to the throne of God. So another question that we ask is, well, what is God's purpose then for allowing suffering? Well, Jonah shows us that suffering exposes our sin and rebellion, right? Jonah had to suffer in the belly of the whale, and then he suffered underneath a little, like, plant that grew up, even though he didn't make it grow, right? Suffering exposes our sin and our rebellion. He had sin and rebellion in his heart. Suffering sometimes keeps us from sinning. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 says this, Paul's writing, he says, So to keep me from being conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me and to keep me from from becoming conceited. So for Paul, he's saying, hey, look, sometimes suffering keeps me from sinning. Suffering always refines our character. All right, Romans 5, 1 through 5 says it this way, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only in that, but he says this, we rejoice in our sufferings. That's crazy talk. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. John Piper writes it this way. He says, suffering severs our bondage with the world. And then when joy and love survive the serving that we have to eat of suffering, then we are fit to say to the world with authenticity and power, hope in God. Suffering also helps us share in the character of God and ministering to others. 
So what does God do then with our suffering? God increases our faith and he strengthens our prayer life. God draws us closer to him and other Christians as they share our burdens. Like for the life of me, I cannot understand where our human condition is predisposed to when we're suffering to run away from other believers, but we do. Paul, if you read in the New Testament, he was never ashamed to ask Christians to pray for him. There's some people like, I can't ask people to pray for me about that. Then they'll know. I'm like, of course, yes, tell them. We should never be ashamed to ask Christians to pray for us. And hear me, we should never shame anyone who asks us for prayer. Because God works through us to bring him glory. Last thing, and then we're done. Because we share in the suffering of comfort of God, we can praise God, we can proclaim his gospel, and we can pray together. Prayer together, team, you guys go ahead and come. Prayer together, not just in my time alone with God. Like a couple weeks, we're going to begin on Wednesday, September 18th, a core class that we're just pausing all the other stuff and saying, hey, we want all the classes to come together. Men, women, co-ed, whatever, single, come. Because for six weeks, we're going to talk about empowered living. And then for 30 minutes, we're just going to look at Holy Spirit empowerment in our lives. And then the other 30 minutes, 40 minutes, we're just going to get our faces and pray in different groups. We're just going to pray. We're just going to ask God, like, God, do this, please. We're going to enter into some of the things that we've talked about with our prayer points. We're going to have to pray about them together. And that's why it says prayer is together and not just in my time alone with God. God in his sovereignty, it's crazy. God in his sovereignty has chosen to limit his activity to the prayers of his people. And so God has designed his activity to flow in response to his people calling out to him. Now hear me when I say this, don't think you and I are powerful or that prayer is powerful. Prayer is not powerful, but the one to whom we pray is. John Piper writes it this way. He says, prayer is the walkie-talkie of the church on the battlefield of the world in the service of the word of God. It is not a domestic intercom to increase the temporal comforts of the saints. It literally malfunctions in the hands of soldiers who've gone AWOL. Prayer is for those who are on active duty. And in their hands, prayer provides, proves the supremacy of God in the pursuit of the world. When missions moves forward by prayer, it literally magnifies the power of God. When ministry moves forward by human management, it magnifies man. And what we desire is that God would be glorified through our praising, through our proclaiming, through our persevering, and through our prayer. Would you stand with me? God, today, Lord Jesus, we want to praise you. Now in response, Father, we may have never received Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So all this talk may sound crazy because we've never shared in the sufferings of Christ because we've never signed up to follow Jesus. We've never, we've never responded to the invitation of responding to Jesus. So I pray that we would today. We wouldn't leave without saying yes to you, God. We'd, we'd lay our, our yes on the altar and say, I'll, I'll take your forgiveness. And Lord, I'll also take all the, all the comfort and all the suffering that comes with it. Oh, Jesus, Lord, would you save someone today? Lord, there are others after seeing Jocelyn be so bold in baptism, God. They, they've been saved, but they've never made their profession of faith public to other believers. Say, I'm a follower of Jesus. God, I pray they would do that today and we could baptize them even now if, if need be. God, there are others, Jesus, who they're stirring. Father, they need to join this fellowship. God, others just need to pray. Lord, you move in us as we sing to you in Jesus' name, amen.